everyone, and welcome to this edition of our Seven Investing Podcast, where it's our mission to empower you to invest in your future. I'm Seven Investing founder and CEO Simon Erickson. We're going to be talking about the space economy today, and who better to talk to than Andrew Chen and Micah Walter Range? Uh, Andrew is the the co-founder of Procure Asset Manager, uh, Procure Asset Management, excuse me, Procure AM for short, and Micah is the uh, the president of Kalis Partners who provides the fundamental index. Andrew and Micah, I always enjoy these conversations with you. Thanks for joining me on the 7 Investing Podcast. Great to be back. Thanks for having us. Just a real quick review of, of the ETF that you've launched. The UFO is the ticker on this one, but it's a pure play for the space economy. From what I've seen, Andrew, you were the first ones to actually do this out there. Uh, just for anyone who's unfamiliar with your organization or hasn't listened to our podcast before, what's so interesting about the space economy? Why do you create this ETF in the first place? So there are a lot of trend changes that are going on around the world. Um, and space is one that is uh, affecting a, t- a ton of change for all types of industries. And knowing that people are always looking for, you know, what industries are next? How, do, how can I get exposure? Um, you know, ETFs become very important vehicles for people looking to get uh, access to uh, technologies, themes, industries, um, and particularly global themes and, and technologies and industries. And space seemed to me to be one of those areas that would be no different. And you, know, you have many different companies from around the world specializing in all different areas. You have demand from consumers, from companies, from governments, from militaries. And this is something that uh, because of reusable rockets, Um, driving down the cost of launch because of technologies becoming more compact or more expansive in what they can do. Um, What you can do with a satellite now is uh, significantly expanded as well. And so being able to provide investors with exposure to uh, the the constant changes of the growing space economy was something that we hope to be able to provide with UFO and working with Micah and his team on the indexing side uh, has been a you know a tremendous experience for us all, and uh, is really helping us sh- uh, you know, see for ourselves as well the, the opportunities ahead for the space industry. Andrew, I'm a big fan of UFO. I have personally invested in it, and uh, you know we last spoke, uh, you, myself, and Micah in September of 2021. We covered a lot of those things that you had mentioned just then about you know the declining cost cost of launch, satellites, the availability you know that are out there, but. Maybe to keep uh, today's conversation a little bit more relevant and recent, uh, there's a lot that's happened since September of last year. Uh, One that's notably has been there's a war going on in Eastern Europe right now. Uh, You yourself just mentioned that kind of two of the drivers are governments and military. That's probably more relevant today uh, than any time in the last couple of months. How how do you see this this, uh, growing conflict in Eastern Europe impacting the space industry or at least spending in outer space right now? I, neither of you could take that, Micah or, or Andrew, whoever would like to answer. Yeah, uh, certainly. From uh, from an operational perspective, you know what we're really seeing, I think, is the, the first you know, commercial imaging space war. So you, you look at how uh, different capabilities have transferred over from the military to the civilian population over time. So you know, one really good example of that is GPS, which you know, was it developed um, for the U.S. military. And so we really saw that for the first time in the Gulf War back in the early 90s uh, and how that was being used. Uh, and then, of course, you know, that that became commercialized. And so, you know, we all have access to GPS now and it's built into just about everything we use on a daily basis, all those like location based services. But what we're seeing now is, you know, a similar kind of shift happening on the military side um, for for commercial satellite imagery. So, you know, satellite imagery, it's been around for a long time. You know, these companies have been out there, but now people are looking at the conflict in Ukraine and saying, you know, I have access to almost real time information about what's happening on the ground. So you have, um, you know, relief workers coming in from across Europe, you know, people just delivering supplies, you know, participating in the defense of Ukraine. And they are able to do that because they can look and see, you know, do these bridges still even exist? You know, where are the likely places where, you know, we might get ambushed with with supplies, you know, that we're trying to get through to these besieged cities? You know, what are the safe passages to get people out of the conflict zone? And and you have all of that happening. Um, 
and uh, sorry, my audio just switched. Can you still hear me? I sure can. Go ahead, Micah. You're coming through loud and clear. We hear you. No problem. Okay. Yeah. Sorry about that. I just had to get you back. Um, so, so we've got all of these things going on where where people are saying, "How do I use space to to support the Ukrainian war effort?" And and you also think about the media battle that's playing out, uh, and how I'll probably get a lifetime ban from Russia for saying this, but one of the enduring images of Russia's absolute failure to accomplish their early objectives was that long convoy stretching for miles outside Kiev. So, you know, we could see that from space and that was, you know, transmitted around the world. And so that, that made people sit up and say, oh, maybe the Russians are not going to accomplish what they're trying. Maybe it is still worth the effort <laughs> to try to help Ukraine. Um, and you think about how that shifted you know, attitudes and, and frankly, political decisions around the world. So, you know, th those are just some of the impacts. And then, then you get into the, the very specific parts, like what is happening in space. And it turns out the Russian approach was not necessarily to attack satellites in space that were providing services in Ukraine. They attacked the ground systems. So it was more cyber warfare against the terminals that people use to connect you know, via satellite. Um, and so, you know, that's, that's got the industry now thinking about, you know, what are the real targets, um, you know, if they get caught up in a conflict again in the future. Some, some great points there, Mike, uh, you know, it, certainly there's, there's military operations that can benefit, benefit from satellite imagery. As you're translating that, like you just mentioned about GPS um, into businesses that are profiting from this, W would logistics be be one opportunity for that? I mean, you've got a lot of stuff that's being shipped around the world that has to worry about weather and, you know, things like this. Is, is that the opportunity for satellite imagery from a commercial setting? Or is there beyond that um, opportunities you think you're excited about as this goes to the commercial space economy? Yeah, so logistics are a huge part of it. And, you know, it, when you think about weather forecasting, that's a huge one. Um, you know, if you're talking about air travel or... Um, or shipping in particular, you know, maybe less for uh, ground transportation. Um, so that's an area where uh, the the commercial industry, you know, that's not traditional imagery, um, but it's still data that's being collected from space by these commercial satellites. And so they're working with governments now to see, you know, how do we add as an industry to the data set that's built up using the government satellites. So, you know, weather forecasting agencies, they have they have these, you know, big multi-billion dollar satellites that they put up there that gather, you know, the, the best data possible. But, you know, is there a way to supplement that and, and provide additional detail and more rapid refresh um, for the calculations that go into weather forecasting? And can you do it, uh, can you provide more localized insight? So uh, I'll just give you one example. I was talking to some people um, working on offshore wind farms recently. And they said, you know, it would be really great if we could get real-time insight from space on the height of the waves around those turbines, because that affects whether we can get a boat up alongside to do maintenance or not. You know, if it's above a certain height, then the sea's just too choppy and we can't do it. And similarly, you know, because those turbines, they, they are really optimized to face directly into the wind. And, and that's actually quite hard to do. So if you can monitor an entire field you know, from space and say, well, it looks like that one's you know, 10 degrees off from the direction that the wind is coming, you know, then you adjust it, you're increasing power output and you're decreasing the wear and tear uh, on machinery. So you've got all these emerging applications that uh, you know, some of them are very government oriented and some of them are absolutely not. It's just things that the regular economy needs like power. Andrew, let me come to you in just a minute for this, because I, you, you know, as uh, one investor to another, I'm interested in where the opportunities from, from what Mike is describing arise. B before I do, though, Michael, one more thought that I'd like to pick your brain about is ESG seems to be kind of a rising um, concern, especially amongst institutional investors. The E being environmental, a lot of that being carbon related and atmosphere related. Are we sensing things more effectively from outer space that might tie into this theme? Or is that kind of still off the radar of, a, of an ESG investor that would be interested? 
Yeah, so there are there are companies out there, um, space companies that have built their business on providing monitoring services um, for carbon emissions and other emissions too. Um, so there's one company, uh, GHG Sat, still a private company, uh, based up in Canada, and uh, and that is a service that they provide to um, you know power stations and other emitters is to say look we will track your emissions from space so that improves your compliance it improves your reporting it improves your operations frankly and, and that's why the or the the power stations and other customers sign on because it's more effective to do the monitoring from space than it is to send a guy out with measuring equipment <laughs> mm-hmm. you know in a car to different points around to you know take measurements periodically um, so yeah, it, definitely a lot to contribute on that front. Um, you know, climate science in general uh, would be nowhere near what it is today if we didn't have the monitoring from space um, to see global temperatures changing, uh, water levels. That's another one that you can detect. So you know, when we're talking about droughts across the country, you know, how do you actually detect that? How do you know how bad a drought is? Space can tell us that you know, before you actually start running out of water in the ground, um, because you can even see things like the the height of the ground changing as those subterranean aquifers are you know, drained and then the ground sinks down uh, accordingly because it's not being held up. There's nothing there anymore. So space is fantastic on that front. And then just the environmental concerns about the space industry itself. Yes, you know, as the number of launches go up, you know, there is a concern. But at the same time, I'm seeing new launch vehicles coming to market that have very minimal uh, carbon emissions, very minimal environmental impact. They're being engineered to be as clean as they possibly can be. Uh, And I think that's an encouraging sign for the industry as well. Andrew, let me bring it back to you. You know, uh, one of the things I love as being an investor is being innovative, look, looking at markets that are changing, looking how things are changing out there. It almost always requires an enabler, uh, somebody that's going to push the change that, that others um, will commercially take advantage of, right? So examples that I've seen in my own seven investing recommendations, we've seen this in life sciences and genomics. Somebody had to be the Illumina that would go out there and make DNA sequencing affordable for hospitals and, and oncologists to, to benefit from it. Uh, semiconductor industry, the same thing. There had to be fabs that were actually making smaller and smaller node sizes for the logic gates that would go into the world's most advanced chips. I mean, space economy certainly has my interest because it's that same story of innovation that there's a lot of infrastructure and a lot of CapEx, capital expenditures that has to go into this industry. Uh, The reason that I bring this up is last year was a great time to raise money if you were a space company. We saw so many raising money through special purpose acquisition uh, uh, vehicles, you know, the SPACs that we saw, special acquisition, excuse me, special purpose acquisition companies, the SPACs. Um, it, it was kind of the, the perfect time to raise money for a business that needed to put it to work. Different story today, Andrew. Uh, rates are going up. Economies might be heading into recession. It's very difficult to raise capital. How has the market sell-off and the investing environment impacted your thinking about space economy? Or, or is there no difference in thinking from 2021 to 2022? Yeah, you know, it's not necessarily as much our thinking as what kind of broader broader markets and uh, participants are are thinking. Uh, you know, we could even elaborate a little bit more on you know what we've seen with Ukraine and Russia, and you know there are opportunities that are that are immediately emerging from the fallout from this conflict. And so, you know, one major area, uh, you know, we talked about satellites being a you know important factor in modern warfare, but you know. Uh, Russia was uh, a leader in uh, in launch, and you know even the U.S. relied on Russia for launch capabilities for for numerous years um, until more players came forward offering launch solutions. And so, countries, companies, militaries that previously were okay doing business with Russia as long as Russia could be you know a good partner and help them achieve their goals. Um, they're starting to rethink that, and this could be something that could impact the Russian commercial space industry for, for decades or possibly even longer. And so as companies start to, to look at what their next goals are, what their next missions are, um, you know, they'll start to, to take in um, to account how good of a relationship we have with, uh, with the country that uh, these services are being operated from. 
And so it, particularly in the area of launch, um, you know, uh, Amazon and, and Project Kuiper came out uh, announcing a, a massive commercial launch deal. Uh, you know, there are plenty of players out there that have requirements for launch. And there are only so many um, currently active launch vehicles, only so many currently active launch pads where you can uh, where you can provide these services from, you know, creating more infrastructure here on on Earth to help us be able to pick up with these increases of demand for launch capabilities, um, you know, is a is an industry within its own. And when you look at some of these newer companies, um, you have like a Rocket Lab or an Astra that are providing launch services. It'll be interesting to see people that were possibly considering working with Russia for for those needs. If they pivot and that creates you know increased demand and just from satellites alone you know, these massive networks uh massive constellations require you know numerous launches it's not you know typically hey you send up one payload and your and your constellation is done you know they, these are multi-year deals with launch providers and that's creating some you know some really interesting opportunities in the immediate and long term for non-russian commercial space companies um so i think that's your know, one major area but then also um, we probably touched on it on the last time we spoke, um, you know, the militarization of space. Um, you know, we've seen Russia successfully demonstrate an ASAT, an anti-satellite uh, missile weaponry technology to take out a, a satellite. Um, you know, that creates debris fields, which creates new risks as well as opportunities um, to you know, avoid debris, figure out how to repair satellites better that get affected by debris, how to reposition satellites so they can avoid uh, debris fields, um, but hypersonics is another major area of concern, especially here in the U.S. and Europe, where we've you know, recently begun to believe that China and Russia have um, outpaced our capabilities in the area of hypersonics. So, A, you need to develop hypersonic technologies and make sure that they're reliable, but you also need to detect them and track them once adversaries have launched hypersonic weaponry. So there are some you know, very pressing issues at the highest levels of government and intelligence and defense that are pushing a lot of these industries as well. And you know, some companies uh, you know, may be positioned to benefit from it. Others um, you know, might not be their, their ballywick. Um, but you know, the government, the military are going to look for you know, strong, strongly capitalized and you know, resilient companies that will be able to, to succeed regardless of you know, broader market conditions, and that might affect contracting going forward. And one step further on that exact note you just made, Andrew, you've got now some very well capitalized companies that are gaining a lot of momentum out there. Maybe they raised money with SPACs last year, maybe they had it from before. Uh, space is hard, you know, it's not enough to just have one technology that works, you want to be an integrated player. Prices are down pretty much across the board from what at least I've what I've seen. Are, are you, do you think we're going to see more acquisitions in this space in 2022? It wouldn't be surprising. Um, you know, in the past, you have you know, some really interesting technologies or companies being developed um, you know, at the private level. And you know, in many cases, those technologies um, wouldn't, wouldn't necessarily see the light of the day or wouldn't necessarily, company wouldn't be able to last long enough to, to get the required contracts to keep those companies afloat. And your really large prime players um, we're able to scoop up you know, really you know, valuable assets on the cheap. Um, you know, that happens across you know, numerous industries in different cycles of the market. When things are cheap, you have companies that are looking to make uh, you know, some value investments and you know, technologies can get spun off in order to do that or companies could get acquired. Um, you know, some companies are you know, vertically and horizontally integrated better than others. Some may see this as an opportunity to find those areas that maybe their company wasn't uh, successful in building organically. So um, you, know, you point to companies that were you know, successful in raising money and you know, uh, although the, the share price has taken a hit, you know, Virgin Galactic, I think was you know, absolutely one of those companies when they saw their stock price uh, rising, they, they made uh, you know, the wise decision to raise capital to help them weather you know, potential future storms. And as we've seen them have to push out further their commercial space launch date, uh, to Q1 of next year, you know, having that capital is going to be you know, very valuable for them for having done so. But not necessarily every company is going to you know, be in that position and uh, you know, could cost more to raise. Um, maybe there's other types of strategic partnerships that companies can get involved in to, to you know, weather the, the storm that we're currently in. 
chatting just a little bit more about launch. You know, you mentioned several launch companies there. Uh, Rocket Lab is one of them. You know, they've kind of democratized space launch. We, we know that this is a bottleneck. We know that just even getting a satellite into orbit is, is not as easy as it sounds like it might be. Uh, you can either work with a, a smaller, more maybe I could call it customer focused company like a Rocket Lab, or you could play by Elon's rules and try to ride share on, on SpaceX and these massive, you know, Falcon heavy rockets that he's got out there. Are, are you seeing uh, what, a preference for one of those approaches or the other where you've got uh, Elon building giant you know, rockets to send satellites into outer space and put up constellations all at, at the same time versus uh, I think Rocket Lab's electron rockets can bring up a payload of like 300 kilograms, very, very small, but they're trying to work their way up through building the neutron rocket and kind of larger and larger payloads. Do you think one of those is more preferential for customers or is it just totally depend on who the customer is and there's room for both of these to win in that space? <laughs> I would say there's absolutely room for both approaches. And, you know, it, it may be different parts of the market. So, you know, for, for large constellations, yes, you know, you're not going to want to do that one at a time. That'll take you years, if not decades, to get your constellation in place. Um, so it, it's simply not an option to go to the small side. Um, but then, you know, for very specific small satellites where you want it to be in a particular orbit. And, and the thing about a small satellite is, it has a limited amount of fuel, maneuvering fuel on board, right? So if you need it to be in a particular orbit, you know, taking the rideshare option may not work for you because it, you know if you can't get from wherever that rideshare wants to drop you off you know, to the location where you really need your satellite to be, you know, you've either used up maybe half your satellite's useful lifetime because you've used up most of your fuel, um, or or you just say, no, that this doesn't make any sense whatsoever. So, you know, there is a need for these other uh, options. And, and again, you know, thinking about the military purposes, this is where there's some interesting experimentation going on um, for, call them tactical satellites. So if you have a specific operation that you want to run and you don't have satellites that are currently scheduled to go over at the right time and provide support and all the rest, you know, can you quickly put a satellite into place to support that military operation? It, it's something that the US government in particular has, you know, calling it toying around with it for years, maybe unfair to the people who put a lot of hard work in, um, but th they haven't really committed to that approach yet uh, operationally. Um, but there is, there is a continued recognition that it is very valuable or could be very valuable if all the pieces can be lined up. And so that's why you know, DARPA in particular likes to fund these you know, small launch vehicles, just helping, helping move the industry forward and get to a point where you could have that type of tactical, very responsive uh, space launch and satellite deployment. So uh, lots of different opportunities there. And, and I do think as well that the, the sovereign question comes into play. So we're seeing uh, nations like the United Kingdom that have never had launches take place you know, from their own soil. Um, they're on track to do that either later this year or sometime next year. Um, they actually have three different spaceports that are moving forward at a, a pretty good rate. Um, and, uh, and different launch vehicles associated with each of those spaceports. Um, so, you know, those are all on the smaller end of the scale, but that might be just right for a lot of the small satellites that are being produced in the UK. They're actually, Scotland, in fact, is one of the leading producers of small satellites in the world. So you see that kind of, you know, matching process going on as well um, as, as national governments think about you know, what do I have? What do I need? And how do I make sure that those things sync up together? Uh, one other part of this that I wanted to hear from both of you about is space tourism. And before we, we started talking, of, even in, for this conversation, we said that this might be something that's getting a lot of attention, but it might not be fully understood or at least represented correctly and accurately in the media today. Uh, certainly you've got Richard Branson, and Jeff Bezos, you know, shooting themselves up into, into, into space and filming themselves floating around. And it's really awesome. It gets a lot of headlines. But critics say that, that maybe space tourism is not ever going to be affordable for most people and that the costs are not going to get to a point that, that people could afford this. Uh, 
what are your thoughts on, on space tourism? How is this misunderstood today? How do you see this evolving? Do you think this is a viable opportunity? Andrew, do you want to take that first? And then I'm happy to jump in. Sure. You know, I, I think there, there, there's absolutely opportunities for you have numerous players in this industry. Um, you know, the, the two, three big factors, you know, first is safety, then cost, then experience um, from my perspective. And you know, to the extent that, you know, companies can successfully, repeatedly do these uh, launches safely, um, you know, that's, you know, the foundation. Now, can people go and have, you know, a fantastic experience? And when they come back, are they happy that they did this or do they regret that they just forked over, you know, uh, a small or, or large fortune in order for, uh, you know, this type of experience? And so we're seeing a little bit more differentiation emerging as far as what these experiences can be. Um, SpaceX does have capabilities to, to provide space tourism as well. Um, in a much more differentiated uh, fashion where you can, you know, send someone, uh, you know, through several, you know, orbits uh, or even several days long uh, type of experience if they so choose to, to move in that direction. Um, but, you know, like you said, it gets the lion's share. Space tourism gets the lion's share of media attention today. But, you know, you look at different analyst projections and by the end of this decade, um, you know, some are predicting that this will be a three to $4 billion annual uh, industry. And that would be less than 1% of the overall space economy today. So there's not necessarily a reason that you know, people shouldn't be excited about it or think that you know, this could be a viable industry. Um, you know, it absolutely does have potential, but you know, is this going to become the largest part of the space industry or the major driver? Um, you know, time will tell, and it's probably going to take a lot of time to, to see how large this industry can truly get. And what I would add to that is, you know, space tourism is an easy term. People understand it intuitively, um, and it has the benefit of being nice and short. Um, the the more accurate term might be something along the lines of, you know, private space flight or commercial human space flight, something like that, because it's not just about tourism. It's not just about, you know, well. Some of them are, <laughs> let's be honest. You know, some of it is just, hey, I, I was weightless and I had a great view and uh, and I took a lot of selfies while I was up there. You know, that, that's absolutely what some people wanna do and that's fine, you know, no issues with that. Um, but then, then I, I think what we are seeing as well is a push, you know, certainly for some of the people doing more extended stays in space, a push to make it commercially valuable. So they're doing research up there. They team up with universities or they may have their own companies that you know, there's something they want to understand better. Um, and so they're taking the, the experiments and, and doing those different kinds of tests up there. And so, you know, I, I think it, it's still very much at what you might consider the, the amateur stage. But I think as time goes on, we're going to see that become more and more professionalized as an industry where we're saying it's not just the government astronauts that are doing the research and experiments and technology development you know, aboard the space station. Um, there are private entities doing this as well. And, and this, is, this has been the case for a long time because uh, NASA in particular has worked with uh, private companies to try to get them and their technology and experiments up to the International Space Station so that they can do research. You know, plenty of examples there, you know, new materials, new uh, techniques for making things. You know, there's a lot you can test in space that you just can't do on Earth. Um, but, but now we're saying, you know, let's move beyond that. Let, let's move to the point where it's it's not that you need to have that partnership with the government. You can just go do it completely commercial, completely private. You know, it is a company to company deal. And, and that might actually make it a whole lot easier for these companies <laughs> to do that type of work. Um, certainly could make it a whole lot faster if they don't have to go through the very lengthy process um, that, uh, that is currently in place. I love that. I think it's a perfect segue for me, Micah, to talk a little bit about kind of how you're constructing the index that follows this. Uh, you know, whereas media sometimes might overgeneralize things, you you clearly, you and Andrew both have a very clear understanding of what's really going on. And um, you're seeing opportunities emerge and kind of even sub-segmenting those into 
uh, maybe smaller markets than a lot of others might might be doing right now. Um, Without talking about the actual trades of the ETF, which anybody can always follow along with those, that's UFO is the ticker on this. Uh, but but maybe if we just philosophically talk about the index that you're creating, um, can, you, can you tell us a little bit maybe about some of the sectors of that you're really interested in, some of the opportunities you see arising out there that, that you're really kind of, kind of excited about? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, the index as it was constructed is very much focused on ensuring that we're delivering, you know, real space companies. Um, and the challenge there is the, the space industry is extremely broad in the sense that there are thousands of companies worldwide that are engaged in it in some capacity. For many of them, though, it's not their primary business. You know, they build a few small parts that happen to go into spacecraft. You know, maybe they you know, have to do uh, additional engineering on those to make sure they meet space industry standards. But, but that's still not really the business that they're in. So, looking to to set this up, uh, you know, when we were doing that, we said, how do we make sure that these are in fact companies that are focused on the business of space? And so we put certain revenue thresholds in place um, that they either needed to get at least 20% uh, of their annual revenue um, from space activities uh, or at least $500 million. So, you know, that allows some of the bigger ones like say Boeing or Airbus, which clearly have much larger commercial aircraft business. Um, you know, they're still also very major players in the space industry, you know, easily doing billions of dollars of business in space each year. So we wanted to capture that too. Um, and then when it came to the weighting of the companies within the index, you know, we're certainly rewarding the pure play space companies with heavier weights and, and recognizing the more diversified companies, uh, but not allowing say the aircraft business to, to substantially shift things on its own. So that's just a, a little bit about the philosophy is how we approach it. And then the, the interesting thing that I've seen just over the past, let's say, 18 months um, is to do with the composition of the index and the companies that are coming in. And so you mentioned earlier SPACs and how a number of space companies have gone to market with a SPAC transaction, um, again, in about the past 18 months, two years. Um, and... And so you know, many of these have been added to the index and, and consequently to the ETF. And the thing that is different about these is they often tend to be much narrower in focus. So they've taken on something like launch or earth observation that previously might've been the domain of these larger diversified companies. Um, and so, you know, just looking at the ones that were added to the index in the last reconstitution in uh, December, 2021, um, we have two launch companies, Rocket Lab and Astra. Uh, we have uh, two Earth observation companies, um, Spire and Black Sky. Uh, some space infrastructure companies, uh, Redwire, uh, Momentus, and, uh, and then uh, just a, a couple other interesting things. One is uh, Arcit Quantum. So that's how do you provide uh, quantum security services through a satellite. And, uh, and so it, it'll be interesting to see how that plays out because no one's ever really done that before. Uh, and then the other one is, um, ah, where is it now? Just lost it. Oh, Minaric, which is uh, laser communications. So, um, you know, most satellites, most uh, communication from satellites is done with radio waves because that's the technology that's been around for a lot longer and it, it certainly works. Um, but as a spectrum gets more congested, people are saying, well, can we do this with laser beams instead? Because that gives you a very tightly focused signal. You don't have to worry about interference as much. Uh, all you have to worry about is transmitting a laser through the atmosphere, which is a little challenging, uh, you know, in order to carry the data from point to point. Um, so this is another area that's moving forward. And, and so, you know, just looking at those companies, you know, very specific pieces of the space industry, very specific business focus for each of them. Um, and, and so they've gone to market that way, but now we are seeing some of them like Rocket Lab as an example, where they're best known for launch because that's what the company was built around. But uh, a little while ago, they also acquired a satellite 
manufacturing company. And last quarter, most of their revenue came from building spacecraft and not from doing launches. And that'll probably change. It'll fluctuate, you know, depending on what's happening in any given quarter. But I think it's a very healthy sign that these companies are saying, okay, we focused on our core competency. Now we're building out. And that goes to the, the point you raised earlier as well about acquisitions. The companies that have the cash still from their fundraising last year or, or before, if they have that on hand, they might find some very attractive acquisition opportunities out there in the current market when valuations of targets are potentially depressed. Um, so uh, I think it'll be interesting to see how many of them act on that. And then my, my one final question before we, we, we wrap this topic up, Mike, is, you know, we were talking about innovation earlier. We mentioned semiconductor industry. We talked about life sciences industry. Uh, each of those, since we're talking about opportunities, have, have big pain points that need to be solved in those industries, right? So for the semiconductor example, it's Moore's law. It gets really, really hard as you're making smaller and smaller chips to economically produce it in a way that you can make a chip affordable. Uh, life sciences, I would argue, it, at least in genomics, would be the variant of, un of unknown significance. You know, you see, you see things in the genome, but you don't really know how correlated they are with diseases. These are just examples of like problems, pain points in these industries that might not have a, a clear-cut solution yet. C could you give me maybe just one or two of those pain points in space economy that companies are actively trying to solve right now? But, but maybe we don't have a, a really great solution for it yet, but you think that that could be an opportunity. Mm -hmm. So one of them actually addresses the semiconductor challenge. <laughs> so you know, linking the two together very nicely. Um, and, and that is the idea of manufacturing in space. You know, what can you do there that you cannot do on Earth? So there's one company uh, based in the UK uh, called SpaceForge that is looking to build on research that was done, I believe, by NASA several decades ago on you know, building semiconductors in space or, or, or manufacturing you know, very specific components. Um, and and you know, those experiments were a huge success, but utterly pointless because who's going to go and do that in space? It's not economical to do that. So what SpaceForge is working on is building effectively small factories you know, inside a, a small satellite um, where you launch it up and then the manufacturing takes place in space for these you know, very high value, you know, limited run uh, components. And then you have the satellite deorbit, you capture it, uh, and then you take the parts out again. And how do you do that cost effectively? Well, that's what they're working on right now. And they raised some funding recently, uh, another funding round to keep working on that. So they, they seem to be making good progress. And I think you know, it's that, that logistics element is still a challenge. So even though launch prices have come down tremendously to the point where we can even consider something like this, there is still a lot more to be worked out when it comes to bringing things back from space economically or moving them around in space. Um, and so, yeah, lo logistics, I, I think, will continue to be uh, a pain point for at least a little while, but people are working on it. And, uh, and I think in the next few years, we might see some breakthroughs. Fantastic. And Andrew, if you could bring us home with one last question here, you know, thinking about investing in the space economy in 2022, we've talked about some of the challenges, you know, with funding and raising rates, uh, but it certainly seems like there's plenty of opportunities, several of which are, are still unmet by anything that's commercially available right now. How are, you, how are you thinking about investing in this space in 2022? Bigger picture, what should investors be watching out there? Yeah, you know, you know, there have been you know, tons of research as far as, you know, from investment analysts at different banks as far as, you know, where they see space going, um, you know, the next 10, 20, you know, 50 years. And, you know, one thing that, you know, seems to get missed is, yes, you know, there are, you know, large estimates of, you know, how large the industry could be, but, you know, a major driver of that is communications. So, you know, broadband internet, connecting, you know, the world to remote places, uh, in remote places to the rest of the world. Um, and many believe that, you know, over 50% of the growth over the next, you know, few decades will come from, um, you know, satellite, broadband, internet, things like that. 
And so, you know, UFO is a fund that has, you know, a fairly large satellite related exposure. Um, and many, many funds just don't provide that much satellite exposure. So that's a really um, kind of interesting area that uh, UFO has you know, been providing exposure to for investors. Um, but really, you know, it's, you know, it's a volatile market. It's volatile across you know, many different industries. So industries that have been performing well, even like, like energy, um, it has also been volatile. And you know, it's going to be difficult, just like any other industry, to pick who the winners are. But I think you know, one, of the, one of the things that excites me about UFO is that this underlying index is you know, reconstituted semi-annually, rebalanced quarterly, and it's a global index. And you know, as space becomes more collaborative um, or potentially less collaborative, like we're seeing with uh, the fallout from you know, the Russian-Ukraine conflict, um, you know, there are numerous opportunities that are emerging. There are new technologies that are you know, helping us uh, achieve new types of things in space. Um, and your diversification, I think, is one of those interesting things about utilizing um, you know, an ETF, especially one with a global focus. So you know, there are companies around the world that a typical U.S. investor might not be able to invest in because, hey, we're domiciled here. Um, your UFO is providing access to companies um, you know, around the world, and that could be you know, pretty, pretty interesting. And your diversification is a tool that you know, many investors can, uh, can utilize. Pretty awesome, Andrew. Not only uh, exposure to the rest of the world, but also orbiting around the world itself. Uh, well UFO is, is the Procure AM uh, ETF, that ticker on that UFO for anyone interested. Uh, Andrew, I really appreciate you being on the program. Andrew is the CEO and co-founder of Procure AM. Really enjoyed the conversation with you here today. Thank you very much, Simon. Pleasure as always. And Michael Walter Range, you know, constructing the, the index underlying the ETF. Mike, it's always a pleasure hearing your perspectives as well. Thanks for being on the 7 Investing Podcast. Hey, it's a pleasure. And thank you everyone for tuning in to this edition of our 7 Investing Podcast. My name is Simon Erickson. We are here to empower you to invest in your future. We are 7 Investing.